she doesn't know she so she's got a bad hip but she doesn't know that so every single time she would still be like play fetch play fetch play fetch yeah. and she'll go hard out and then five minutes later she'll be limping and she'll be like why am i limping and i'm like because you're an old dog <laughs> Um, it was tough when I first moved to New Zealand. I moved here when I was 12 with mm -hmm. my family. And I know a bit of English because I came from Hong Kong and we had to learn English as a second language at school. But I was nowhere near fluent. Um, and it was an interesting time and struggle because first of all, a lot of things I know that if it's in Chinese, I would be able to do, mm -hmm. like at school, for example. And all of a sudden, I can't express myself because I don't know the English words for things. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I went from being that annoying kid in primary school that does everything and does yeah. everything well, to the other extreme of, oh, she's the weird new student who doesn't talk a lot. And so when people say that, oh, um, we don't have racism in New Zealand, I feel like that they haven't been exposed to it rather than they, there isn't any. And sometimes it's not even things that people who aren't from minority group will perceive as a racism thing. So really, the example that stuck in my head is once I was talking to an older gentleman on a professional setting, we were just having casual chat. And then he said, um, oh, I heard that you married a Kiwi husband, meaning a Caucasian husband. And I said, like, yeah. And then, and then he said, good for you. And then, <laughs> and then I kind of don't know how to respond to that because there's so much implications about, you know, having, first of all, using Kiwi as a, you know, as a, as a synonym to white is huge to start with. And then somehow I'm doing well because my choice of partner happens to be white was also, wait a second, what? Mm. <laughs> they might think of it as, oh, I'm just trying to make small talk. But as soon as you see my as soon as you hear my accent, as soon as you see that I'm Chinese, then all of a sudden I'm reduced to where are you from as you trying to get to know me as a person. And I think that you're missing out a lot on the person because of that. Mm. Um, and I'm lucky enough to um, come to New Zealand when I was still quite young with my family. So my English is fluent, whereas I see a lot of immigrants who has a much stronger accent, who deal with that a lot worse. And people somehow think that people are less intelligent because they have an accent. And that really, that one really irks me. And I think it's because I went through similar things when I was in, um, in intermediate school when I know I can solve this in my language. I'm not stupid. It's just that I don't have the words for it or that I, sometimes it's even weird things like I can spell it, but I can't pronounce it because I've came across it in a book, but I've never heard it said out loud. And so if you judge somebody from the accent or their English with their intelligence, then it's gonna be so frustrating for the other person. That's a really good question, because I think when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, because I know I'm good at maths, I'm good at science, I also really like arts. And um, for a long time, I wanted to go into design, but then, um, coming from a Chinese parents, my dad was quite discouraging about going down the design route. And, and when it's come to maths and science, all I knew was that, well, I could be a maths teacher or a scientist, whatever scientist actually means. And it's not until my physics teacher in my seventh form, mm -hmm. and she talked about engineering and she said that she wished she'd known about engineering when she was in um, high school, then she would go into engineering instead of physics. And, and then that's when I started looking into engineering because I think I had heard of what an engineering degree is about. Mm -hmm. um, and I have cousins who are engineers, but I never kind of stop and think about what do engineers actually do mm -hmm. and is it something that's for me. And so 
um, it's kind of serendipitous that, you know, I just happened to have a really good physics teacher who said, yeah, engineering is going to be really fun because yeah. you love solving problems. Yeah. I think we were the second year in the Auckland University Engineering School when they started offering computer systems engineering, which is a mix of that hardware system as well as the software side. And I thought that would be a really good mix mm. for me. Um, and yeah, so that's what I picked mm. in my second year. Mm. Actually from the former camp, I have no idea what I wanted to do. And me doing my postgrad was kind of almost like an easy way out. I had a scholarship. I don't have to find a real job. And I love, I love learning. I love um, research. And this remains as something that is quite core to my identity. I love finding things out. Mm. But I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, the company that sponsored my PhD project also um, wasn't there anymore when I finished my project. Um, it was a startup and yeah. startup comes and goes. So I wasn't sure whether or not I want to work in the industry or I want to do a postdoc and continue to work in academics. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I know what the academics life is like. So let's try a few years in the industry and then I can make a decision after that. So around that time, a friend of mine from engineering um, started a startup to automate forklifts. And so when I finished my PhD, I kind of asked them, hey, are you guys hiring? <laughs> and he said, yeah, we want somebody to look at some of the maths and some there's some, always some maths numbers crunching that we yeah. are interested in. And so I went into it without purposely thinking I want to go into robotics and that's how I got into robotics was completely opportunistic it's like hey there's an opportunity so that was my first job and I'm still with the same group after yeah. acquisition we got acquired by a bigger forklift, um, forklift manufacturer so the lift truck manufacturer crown acquired us back in 2012 and kept the team on so mm. I'm still with that group now yeah so how long has it been since you started though? yeah it's been God, it's been over 10 years, so almost 11 years, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, and we've been part of Crown for nine years. Yeah. It's an interesting question to ask. I just had my 39th birthday, so, so this is kind of like, what if I achieved in my 30s, right? And then I realised that, you know, rather than saying, this is my goal and I want to do that, I'm trying to focus a lot more on how do I do continuous improvement? I certainly have a lot of passions for certain areas of things, like building a community is something that mm -hmm. I am really passionate about. And I gained a lot from being part of a community and I really like to give back to that. Um, I'm also very passionate about um, waving my, you know, waving my banner about um, implicit bias and conscious bias um, and how it affects um, us, ourselves in uh, both in the work environment and also on a, you know, on a society level. Um, so those are still things that are part of my identity and hold dear to me. But right now, instead of saying, well, this is what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm trying to achieve this audacious goal, it was more, how do I do things better in a sustainable way along the way. All the time. <laughs> um, one thing that helps me is talking about it and realizing that everybody has yeah. a bit of imposter syndrome and nobody has a model answer. A really good example is I got asked to join an industrial advisory group for um, one of the spearhead research project of the National Science Challenge. And it really is just, you know what, I'm gonna say yes anyway. And then I'll figure it out when I go. And the first meeting, I really was, like I almost was paralyzed with imposter syndrome going, why am I even here? What am I doing? And pushing through that was great, mm. but it wasn't easy. And it's not about 
I need to do that when I stop hearing that voice. It's about, I'm still hearing the voice and I'm gonna push through it and do it anyway. So I came, like, it's an interesting journey that I went through, particularly coming to terms of what feminism actually means. Mm. So when I was in university, I call myself a feminist, but at the same time, there was a lot of really subtle things that I didn't think about. I was quite against the idea of giving the women students special treatment back mm. in university because I didn't see the reason why. And I also thought that oh, people are going to see me as a token hire and see me as a, you know, the token woman in the team and I want to prove my worth as a mm. capable engineer. It's not until maybe even in my late 20s or maybe even yeah. early 30s when I came across this idea of um, unconscious bias or implicit bias um, and then things started clicking with me and I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine who is a cis man and he said, no, you're wrong, you know, this is why we need to have special treatment or this is why we need a quota system for women in certain roles because that's only trying to level the, level, um, the playing ground and the more I read about it, the more I realise that a lot of the ideas and thoughts and maybe even anger that I was feeling comes from, you know, the system that has been subtly or not so subtly stepped against certain groups. Um, and it was so ingrained in our culture that we don't even notice it. When we talk about minority, you need to remember that for that person's life, that's 100% of their life. You know, it might be 1% of your population, 20% of the population, or in terms of women, you know, pretty much almost 50% of the population, but it's 100% of their life. And if you don't design things to, so the society are working for these people, um, you, we're not doing well as a society. Awesome. Or sometimes it might even be as little as like making a particularly good meal then that makes me really happy. Um, learning new things makes me happy, learning new. So when I come across a new idea, when I come across like a uh, new technology or new thing, that is like the aha moment and I really like that. Um, what else makes me happy? Um, Your dog. My dog <laughs> makes me happy, my dog makes me happy. Um, actually, that's the other thing that makes me happy, having like, Interesting conversation with people makes me really happy. And it's something that I um, particularly enjoy. And I don't think that we make enough time for it. I feel like a lot of the time people talk on kind of the service level. And, you know, like the conversation we have today, these conversations don't come naturally enough to us, but I feel like that those com these conversations makes me really happy because it helps me the process thing. It helps me hear from another person what their ideas and views are like, and it broadens my horizon anytime. So, one thing that makes my day, even though I am a bit of an introvert and I have social anxiety, if I go to a gathering a party or a dinner party where people I don't know, but I found a new person that I can have this sort of interesting conversation with, that really made my days. And now I'll be like, oh my God, that person's my new best friend. They're, they're great. 